My brothers and sisters in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ, he had gave many examples in his ahadith. Allah gives many examples in the Quran. One prophetic example he gave of human beings and from which we can derive many lessons from. And it's simple, small hadith, but it has profound meaning. He says, An-nasu ma'adin. And in this hadith, he went a little bit different than what he usually does. He would always use the letter ka for tashbih. Whenever he would give example of something, he would say, this is like that. But in this hadith, he says, human beings are minds. Ma'dan means a mind. Human beings are minds. He doesn't say al-muslimuna ma'adin. The Muslims are minds. He doesn't say al-mu'minuna ma'adin. The believers are minds. He says an-nas. Every single human being, even the one who watched this video who doesn't believe in a God, he's also a mind in the words of the Prophet ﷺ. We are minds. And then once he, it's one to say, Human beings are like minds. But then there's something else to be said when it's human beings are minds. It's like, that man is like Jordan. Or that man is Jordan. Isn't there a difference? Huge difference. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, human beings are minds. Why? Ibn Hajar al mentions a few things about this word ma'dan. First of all, he says, when the Prophet ﷺ said ma'dan, there are some characteristics of minds that we look into. The first characteristic of a mind is that it must be discovered so that we can benefit from it. If it's not discovered, it's useless. Arabs were living in the Middle East for thousands of years. Arabs were living in Hijaz for thousands of years. I visited Kuwait in 2007 or 8, and the Arabs, these people who were living there, they were literally standing and living and sleeping on mines, oil mines. But they could not have sweet water to drink. People would die out of thirst. People would die out of hunger. This man, he said to us that one day, someone came knocking on his door. And he thought that these were quta'u tariq, trespassers. So he took his ammunition out to ready to go. He thought these are looters. So he comes out and they say, Sir, we're here, and they're speaking to him in English. He doesn't understand a word he's, they said, and he rushes them off of his property. A few weeks later, this is, these ears have heard the story directly from the owner of this place. He says, a few weeks later, I was summoned to a, a, a meeting in which many of the royal family members were sitting. And I come there, I was invited as a guest, so I come to the diwaniya, and again, those same people who came knocking on my door were sitting there. So, they, I say, what's going on? What's the story? And they were told that these people, they want to put some machinery on these hundreds of acres of land that you own. They're asking permission to put machinery there. I said, no, never. It's my land. They said, no, no, the land is still going to be on your name. The land will not transfer on their name. All they're asking you is if they could put some machinery over here because from their technology and their tests, they have identify that your land is an oil mine. And they now want to put machinery there to pull oil out. And for the property that you give them in the middle of a desert, which you don't even use, they will give you this much money for the machinery they put there, and this much money for each barrel of oil that's taken out from there. And I'm not talking about bidding on eBay for $30. We're talking about millions of dollars. Millions just for putting the machinery and per each barrel. And the man said, Khalas, take it. <laughs> Why wouldn't? So they come knocking on his door, and in an instant he's a millionaire, billionaire. So that oil mine was no use to that person if it was not identified. So, first of all, mines have to be identified. A gold mine is no use if it's not identified. A diamond mine is no use if it's not identified, if it's not discovered. So the first quality of this mind, just to skim through my talk, is that it must be identified and discovered. The second characteristic of a mind, effort has to be made to take that valuable thing out. So what good is it if you identify something great? This is an oil mine. This is a diamond mine. This is a gold mine. But you make no effort to take that out. Lots of effort has to be made 
in order for that product, that, that product to be valuable for you and me and for the people around us. Machinery, money, thousands of dollars have to be put in place for that mind to be valuable now. And that is the, what the Prophet ﷺ is saying to every single individual that is sitting in this room, that we are all minds. Not, not, not as valuable as gold, much more valuable than a gold mine, much more valuable than an oil mine. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the Sahaba, the Prophet ﷺ discovered them, discovered these people. They were minds. First he discovered them. Then he made an effort on them. And this effort of this long, 23 years effort he made on them. And at the end of his life, the night before he passed away, the Sahaba were praying Isha Salah. And Abu Bakr was leading Salah. And behind him were all the great Sahaba. Umar, Uthman, Ali, all the young Sahaba, Abdullah bin Zubair, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, Abdullah bin Umar, Abdullah bin Amr, all the great Sahaba were praying Salah behind this great man Abu Bakr. And the Sahaba haven't seen the Prophet for a few days. He's sick. He's ill. As they're praying Salah, the Prophet, if, if this is the Qibla, if that's the Qibla in front of me, the Prophet's house was on the left of the Qibla. If we go right now, the Prophet's house is on the left of the Qibla. And the Prophet, he, the Sahaba said, we're praying Salah, and all of a sudden, we sense that the curtain moved from the house of the Prophet. Right? So we start looking towards the left. You know, Imam Hanifa says, when you're in front of the Kaaba, it's afdal to look down and pray salah. But all of us were Maliki and Shafi'i when we go to Mecca. We look straight at the Kaaba. We're not looking down over here. Imagine the Sahaba who is standing there. Yes, it's Sunnah to look straight down. But the Prophet's face is manifesting from the curtain. Their eyes started going that way. Started looking towards the left. And now this beautiful brimming face of the Prophet ﷺ. If you never spoke a word and you just saw his face, you would fall to your knees and accept Islam. Right? So he, the curtain moves and the Sahaba start looking towards the left. And they see this man, he has his hand, he has his hand underneath his chin like this. And his head is tied with a cloth because he had a severe fever. So he had a wet cloth tied on his head. Like this. And the Sahaba start looking towards the left. And all they see is this man sitting there leaning on his hand and he starts smiling. He has this fulfilled smile on his face. And then he puts the curtain away, draws the curtain and the same night he passes away before Fajr Salah. Ibn Hajr al writes about this and he says, the Prophet at that time وسلم, could have cried. He could have done anything, but why did he smile? And he says he smiled because he was so proud of the Sahaba. He was looking at Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and the efforts they made to reach this point. And he was so proud that he was leaving his deen in their hands. He was like a father before he dies. And he has this business that he gave his entire life for. And he looks in the room and he sees these great children that can carry on his legacy. How proud is his soul when he's put to rest. Versus that father when he looks in the room and he doesn't see nobody that can carry on his legacy. When Umar bin Abdul Aziz was leaving this world, he looks at Raja bin Hilwa and he says, Oh Raja, I'm the one that put Abdul Malik bin Marwan and Suleiman bin Abdul Malik, and all, the, all these great emperors before me, I'm the one that put them to rest in their, in their graves. And the sunnah of burying somebody is to untie the knot on his head and his feet when you put the body in the grave. He says, I was the one responsible to untie these knots. And Abdul Malik bin Marwan, they say, Lahu wa jahatun wa basaratun wa basiratun. He was a very beautiful person. And he says, I untied the knot, and I wanted to make sure that his face is facing the qibla. And as untied the knot, his face turned into charcoal black. And as I was trying to turn his face towards the Qibla, the face was refusing, it was so heavy. And he says, everyone before, same thing happened. He says, oh Raja, when you put me to rest, please untie my knot and look at my face and see where it's, which, which way it's facing. And just look at it. If it's facing the wrong way, make dua for me. And then before leaving this world, he looks towards his children, doesn't leave them with anything. And he says to them, I have left you with Allah and His Rasul. Are you happy with me? And the children say, we're, we're totally satisfied. On the day of the Eid, 
when he comes home and his daughters are, are they're covering their mouths with their, with their dubattas, with their cloth, like this. And he asks his wife, Fatima bint Abdul Malik, why are these people, why are, these, why are my daughters covering their mouths for? And on the day of Eid, of the Khalifa of the world, not some random person, on the day of the, in, the, in his house, they say, the wife responds and, he, and she says, that today we did not have food to eat, so our daughters had to eat uncooked onions. That's all they had to eat, and because of that, they're covering their mouths while they're speaking to you. So this, the Prophet looks at the Sahaba, and he's so proud of what they have accomplished, and he's leaving the deen in their hands. Today, my brothers and sisters in Islam, if the Prophet ﷺ looked at our lives, would he smile or would he cry? Would he be happy, would he be sad? What would, what would, what would, be, what would be his reaction? That is why the first, the first and foremost thing that we must understand is that all of us are ma'dans, we are minds. This ma'dan has to be discovered, and after it's discovered, an effort has to be made. Abu Yusuf rahimahullah, seven-year-old kid sitting in front of Imam Hanifa. He comes sneaking into the back door, he sits, sits in front of this great teacher. And every single time he sits in front of him, his father opens the door of the masjid, and he says to his son, he says to his son, leave this gathering, don't sit with this old man, this old man that's just teaching you, you don't make any money from sitting here, leave. And every day he shuns him out. One day, Imam Hanifa, he confronts the father, and he says to the father, he said, why are you removing your son from my gathering? He's learning ilm. And the father, he looks at him from the back, from the back he scolds him, he says, Abu Hanifa, you are a merchant, you have money, and this kid is a poor kid, we're, we're, we're from a poor family, he has to do labor work and earn money for this house to be sustained. So this kid needs to work. Imam Hanifa says, Ya Rajul, inni ara ibnak, yattakiu ala ara'ik al-maluk, wa ya'kulu al-faludha bil-faludhaj. He says, I see your son, the seven, eight-year-old kid, I envision your son discovering a ma'dan. I envision your son one day sitting on the chairs of the kings of this world and eating this very lavish dish called al-lawd bil faludaj. That this was a sweet dish that only the kings would eat and everybody else would eat something else. That man, he said, before I thought you were crazy, now I know you're crazy. That my son's gonna sit on the chairs of kings and eat lawd bil faludaj, are you nuts? And he said, he said, get out of here, don't sit with this crazy person. And Mahanifa then stops him and he says, and this is the tragedy of our times. That in those days, they had people like Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad, Ahmad bin Hanbal, Imam Bukhari as the people who were discovering talents. And today you people are left with people like us. People that have, we are like, we are nobodies, full of sins. And we're the ones that are supposed to discover talent and make and people send their children to our schools and please make them a hafid and alim and we're still trying to get out of our own quicksand. They had Imam Abu Hanifa. He said, listen, how much does he earn every single day? And the father said, he earns two dirhams. Abu Hanifa, he said, listen, I'll give you two dirhams every single day. Let him stay here. Let him stay here. He said, you, you sure? I said, I promise you, I'll give you two dirhams every single day. Every day Abu Yusuf will sit in the majlis of Imam Hanifa, learn, study. At the end of the gathering, Abu Yusuf would go say salam to Abu Hanifa and he would give him two dirhams. Give it to your father. I cannot make this story very long. Many, many years later, this man Abu Yusuf, he walks inside the palace of the king of the time. Who was the king of the time? Harun Rashid. He walks into his palace. Harun Rashid sees Abu Yusuf walking in. As he walks in, he says, make space for the Shaykh. Harun Rashid was the first king to travel to seek knowledge. Very amazing personality of our, of our heritage. And he had a very good taqdeer. Abdullah bin Mubarak and Abu Yusuf were in his gathering all the time. So he says, make space for the Shaykh. From Banu Abbas, make space for him. So they made space. And Imam Abu Yusuf was made to sit on the chair of Harun Rashid. So he sits down. And as the, the food's gonna be served now, and before the food is served, this very precious food, this item, was brought in this very precious utensil, and it was presented to Harun Rashid. He opens it, and he looks, he says, no, ibda' bi-shaykh. 
Start with the Shaykh. So then he gives Abu Yusuf. Abu Yusuf opens it and he sees it's Lawd bil Faludaj. He looks at it. First, he laughs. He laughs very loud. After laughing, he starts crying. So Harun Rashid says, Why are you laughing and crying for? I just gave you something that only kings eat. Abu Yusuf said, I'm laughing. At my father's reaction when my teacher said to him that your son will sit on the chair of kings and eat laud bil faludaj, I'm laughing at his reaction. That's what makes me laugh. And then I cry because my teacher was such a visionary. He made so much effort on me. And then he said, would you allow me to take this dish to my mother who's still alive and show her that this old man's dream came true? And she'll be so happy. And Harun Rashid said, go ahead. He goes and he opens this dish in front of his old mother. And the old mother says, Sadaqa ru'ya al-majnoon. That crazy man's dream has come true. Brothers and sisters in Islam, none of us know who the next Shafi'i is. He was a two-year-old kid that was orphaned, leaving Gaza, going to Makkah al-Mukarramah with no money. But he became Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah. They understood that they had much more than what the people around them told them. They understood that they were not that lion among sheep that thought that lion was a sheep. But it, they discovered themselves when they looked at the riverbank and saw themselves in the riverbank and realized that I'm not a sheep, but I'm a lion. And all this artificial stuff around me that's convincing me to be bottled in and convincing me to be just a regular somebody. I'm much more than that. And they discovered that. How Allah Mekbar says, Khudi ku kar buland itna. Khudi ku kar buland. Like realize who you are to such a degree. Ke har taqdeer se pehle khuda bande se khud puche. Pata teri raza kya hai. That before you do anything in life, Allah asks you, what do you want? And Allah does it according to that. Wala sawfa yu'atika rabbuka fatarda. Wala sawfa yarda. Qad nara taqallabu wajhika fi sama. Falanuwaliyannaka qiblatan tarda. Allah starts telling you, Allah starts making things around you in a manner that you wish and would you would love. And I end this topic by saying people who discovered their talents and they gave their entire life for the sake of Allah after discovering their talents, they were not regular people. We read history books that when Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimahullah passed away, there was 1.2 million people there for his janazah. We were shocked. In a time where there was no social media, in a time where there was no text messaging, and the same day that man passes away, there's 1.2 million people there, and for, him, for somebody to reach his body that came for his janazah, if he was to stand in line, it would take him two days and two nights. So we thought, this can't be true. But then a great man, a saint, who passed away by the name of Sheikh Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, last week, 96 years old, understood that he's a ma'dan, understood his talents and then made an effort that my potential should be utilized for the service of this deen. If my potential is utilized to discover the next app, great. But how will you be remembered when you leave this world? When Sa'ab bin Abi Waqas came and they conquered the palaces of Kisra and everybody is rejoicing. And Sa'ab bin Abi Waqas, he prays two rakahs salah. And after praying two rakahs, he starts to cry like a baby. And Suraka Radhanu asks him, Ya Sa'ad, why are you crying for? This is a day of happiness. And he says, I remember the, the eye of Allah. Kam taraku min jannati wa uyun. Wa zuru'i wa maqamin kareem. Wa na'matin kanu fiya faqiheen. Like I remember the verses of Allah. Like these people, how much did they leave behind? They left their palaces, their rivers, their luxuries. فَمَا بِكَتَ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّمَاءُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَا كَانُوا مُنْذَرِينَ The earth nor the sky cried on their departure. When we leave this world, would someone miss me? Have I left an impact on the people around me that if I leave tomorrow, they will miss me? They will cry for me. Today, people move from communities, you don't even remember who they are. When Abu Bakr was leaving Makkah al Mukarramah and Ibn Dukhana caught him on the way, he says, Where are you going? He says, I can't live in Makkah. 
He says, people like you should never leave and never should be kicked out. And that man was not even a Muslim because you do this and you do that. You're good to the poor. You take care of the, your guests. You fulfill the rights of all the people that have duty upon you. You give sadqa. And he said all these great things about him and brought him back to Mecca. If we plan to leave, would someone be standing at the door say, please don't leave? If Michigan, tomorrow all the Muslims of Michigan just walk out and go to some other state, would the non-Muslims of Michigan miss us? They're probably, maybe some liquor stores will close down. Maybe some clinics will shut down. Maybe some home cares will shut down. But would they really feel impacted by our loss? Ahmed bin Hanbal, when he left this world, there was 1.2 million people there for him because he was a man that served humanity. Understood that he was a mind, worked, to dis worked day and night to utilize this mind for the potential of the people around him. There was a man that finally we witnessed last week when he was laid to rest. 1.5 million people were there for his janazah. And there was half a million people that were stuck in traffic only a, within a one to two mile radius from that place where they had the funeral. What did he do? Was he a rich person? Was he on social media? Did he have Facebook followers? Did he have Twitter followers? He had nothing. He did not have any social media account. People laid him to rest. Nobody even knows who he is. But he had one thing, and that was yet the pleasure of Allah. He served mankind day and night. So today, my brothers and sisters in Islam, in this conference, if you can get up with this intention, that my life, my life is not just for myself. My, I have to understand that my life is for the service of my Creator. And I will give up everything I have to make him happy. And I conclude by Umar ibn Abdul Aziz what he said. He said, every single time I wanted something in my life, I got it. I saw this beautiful lady by the name of Fatima bint Abdul Malik. I said, I want to marry her. And I married her. I wanted the most clothes, I got all the clothes. I wanted to be the governor of Medina. I became the governor of Medina. And it says, he says, today I become the Khalifa of the world. And now all I want is to make my Allah happy. That's all I want. And two and a half years when he was laid to rest, a small, a small paper came from the sky on his body that says, Bara'atun min Allah wa Rasulihi li Umar bin Abdul Aziz min al-Nar. That Allah has secured and promised that Umar bin Abdul Aziz will be saved from the fire of Jahannam. Rahimahullah. So there's some, some of us that are sitting in this gathering, we could be the next Shaykh Abdul Wahhab. None of us, this gathering would not take place if it was not for his service for my father. If it was not for this man, my father, he says, we, I saw him one day and I changed my life. How Allah Iqbal, he says, there are some nigahi bande, nigahi mardi mu'min se badal jati hain taqdeerin. There are some people, you just see them and your life changes. We are doing a dis, we're, we're being dishonest and we're being disloyal to the public around us. If we actually develop iman and understand our mind, the non-Muslims around us, right when they see us, they will accept Islam. Like how they saw the Sahaba, and upon seeing them, they change your lives. Today we have to speak, write books, philosophical arguments, debates, comments. But we should be people that when they see us, when you see the sun, you cannot deny the sun. And that is why the Ummah has been given the example of Siraj and Munir. We are the sons that are lighting up the world. Allah make us among those who understand our talents, understand our potential, make an effort to take this out from our lives. How many more mothers are gonna sleep at night with their kids being dishonest and disrespectful to them? How many more tears that these, do these ladies have to shed? How many more tears do these fathers have to shed that their kids who they gave everything to that have kalima la ilaha illallah don't understand their value? How many more masjids have to fight over politics? How many more scholars have to slander each other? What are we waiting for? Enough is enough. And it starts by understanding that we are ma'dans, we are minds, and at the moment we understand that, we have to make an effort in order to benefit from it. Allah make us among those who can make that effort. Zakallahu khairah.